Hello. Well, we've heard all about design, and it's very exciting. But I'm here to tell you, manufacturing's back. And manufacturing's fun. And actually, manufacturing defines who we are. So look at this picture. I mean, these guys are out on the tundra, the Inuits, building things, building things that they need to live. And really, that's what manufacturing is. It's about making things. And I'm, I'm really here to tell you, there, there's, manufacturing's gotten a lot of bad press. But when you can make things reliably and fast and well, it's the most fun thing you can imagine. I'm going to talk about two things today. I'm going to talk about kind of the future of manufacturing, but the old future, what people thought the future of manufacturing was going to be. And I'm going to tell you about my personal idea of what the future really is going to be and how that's so much more important than these older ideas. So manufacturing memories. What does that mean? Well, manufacturing is the art and practice of making things. And the things we make are the things we leave behind for our future generations. For example, the Mustang. That's something we leave behind for the future generations. And that's really an amazing thing. And it's been true ever since the beginning of man. Our collective memory, in a way, is captured by the things we make. You know, as I get older, I start to realize that you know, I, I'm not long for this world. I'm nearly 60 years old. So we don't only, every one of us only lives really a short period of time. But the joint human effort goes on and on through the millennia. And the thing that really binds us together are the artifacts that we leave behind and the memory of how we made those things. And if we forget how to do that, that's an incredible disaster. So what happens if we forget how to make these things? What ha happens if we forget how to make TVs and computers and carpets? And, because it's all automated, we don't need to make it anymore. So I'm in robotics, that's a kind of a strange line. Uh, but I want to focus on this idea that really the future of manufacturing is the future of us, the future of man because it's really how we leave behind our legacy, how we leave behind our memory. So let's talk about the first future of manufacturing. So actually, I built this uh, automated uh, cell to make steam turbine uh, blades for power generation. This was in a Westinghouse plant. I built it in 1985. Uh, and actually, it's still in production today, although Japan bought it out and they moved it to Japan. Uh, it was designed to basically be uh, manufacturing things with no people. So the idea was we'd take these large, cylindrical, heavy steel billets, heat them up to 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, and then pound the heck out of them into the rough shape of turbine blades, and then measure them, and then form them into the shape of basically something that looks like an airplane wing uh, in order to make power. And no people were here until it broke. So actually, robotics breaks, robots break. And what happens if there's no one to come in and fix it? So and this whole idea of lights out manufacturing started with Kurt Vonnegut in 1952. And he has this quote. If it weren't for the people, the goddamn people, said Finnerty, always getting tangled up in the machinery, if it weren't for them, the world would be an engineer's paradise. So in a way, that's what motivated this when DARPA, uh, the Defense Department, started to be so interested in this lights out manufacturing. That was kind of the mantra, kind of the reason we were doing this, because those doggone people were kept getting in the way. Of course, we needed them to fix it when it broke. So what's another future? You've all heard about this new one. We actually heard it about it a little earlier. Uh, replication. Started with Star Trek, you know, ordering up some, some dinner. I always wondered what would happen if you ordered up an elephant or something like that. Would it fit in there? Uh, that's kind of a challenge. Uh, but really, 3D printing is coming to the fore, and we can start to make just about anything. So for $500, you can make little plastic things, figurines. But if you're willing to spend more money, and this technology is moving very fast, you can make almost anything. 
So for example, General Electric has a huge order to make 3,000 jet engines and they've succeeded in printing, just printing, all the parts of a complete jet engine that actually flies. Of course, they took a year to do that print of that one engine. <laughs> so they're kind of hysterical. Um, but the technology is moving so fast, we're going to be able to print faster, we're going to be able to print multiple materials and control the material properties. And of course, this is printing titanium. So if people say, oh, printing is just about plastic things, no, you can print titanium. Uh, in fact, at Carnegie Mellon, we have several machines that we print, and basically you print, you have layers of powder, and you melt the powder with electron beams. So that's one of several new ways uh, that are being developed. But again, where are the people? What do we want people to do in this world? So do we just want to design something and then step back and have it made? Is that really what we want? So that's the question I keep asking myself. What, where do we want to, what role do we want to play in this new world? And I keep thinking that the process of making things is really what defines us. And if we forget how to do that, we've lost so much. So I've been working on a new system where people and robots work together to make crazy, complicated things. So in fact, we made a frame for a military spec Hummer. Uh, and we have, it's welded, it's made of 400 welded parts. And I wanted to show that robots and people working together can do it faster than either one alone. So in a way, I'm changing the game. I'm defining a new game. It's not about automating everything. It's about doing manufacturing very fast and very well, because if you can do it fast, you can also do it cheap, because the cost of things is very tied to how long it takes to manufacture it. So I defined this competition. We have the black team, and black is usually bad, uh, of <laughs> Three welding automotive experts equipped with uh, very special build environments. In fact, this is Pratt & Miller. This is a company outside of Detroit that specializes in turning GM cars, for example, into racing cars. So they basically take the Mustang and tear it all down and replace it with something you can drive 200 miles an hour around a racetrack. So that's what they do full time. And there were three of them and their special fixtures, and they had, of course, CAD systems, but no robot. The people were going to do all the work. And then we had, a, on the red team, we had something a little different. We had one robot, and my student, Mike Dawson Haggerty, and he's standing here looking very officious. Uh, but attached to the robot are some different tools than you're used to thinking. There's augmented reality tools mounted to the robot that tells Mike what and where to do things and there's measurement equipment to make sure that he's done it correctly. So the idea is that Mike can do things and the robot can do things and they can understand what each other has done in a cooperative way. And I'm going to ask these two teams to build a complicated thing. Well, what's that? So here's a custom vehicle that Carnegie Mellon built, the autonomous vehicle, vehicle racing across the desert. Uh, but we're talking about building the frame, which is this green uh, frame inside of it that holds the doors on. Uh, and so we're going to weld that thing. That's the competition. There's 100 tubes, 400 welds. Uh, there are, tubes are basically and come in all sizes and shapes. And it's hard to weld a complicated three-dimensional structure. So how do we do this with these two guys? Well, the first issue is to look at what robots can do and what people can do. And forget all the hype that you've read about in the New York Times and Scientific American uh, about what robots can, how well robots can do various things, but just look at the facts of what robots can do really well and what people can do really well. And I'm going to ask, basically take the task of welding this complicated thing and assigning it carefully to these two guys, the robot and the person. Well, a robot is really good. You strip away all your preconceptions. 
at being a measurement device, a six-dimensional measurement device. So a robot, if I send it to a XYZ location at a certain orientation, it can just move there. If I asked Mike to do that, he'd say, oh, <laughs> I can do that, but where are my tools? Do I have, I, do I have special measurement tools? Uh, how do I measure the angle of the, position, of the part? All of these things he has to worry about. He's actually terrible at this. So the idea is to assign those problems where the robot has to position something precisely to the robot. Uh, so that means Mike, there's nothing for Mike to do. Well, the robot, if you just have one, it's usually this kind of robot's bolted to the ground. They don't have to be. Uh, but that immediately limits what it can access. So in many cases, Mike is incredibly flexible, and we see him kind of literally dangling around in the structure, accessing parts of the structure the robot can't readily access. So I'm not, I'm trying to make one of these cheap. <laughs> so I'm trying to really assign, not care about whether it's automated, just to do it fast. Well, the robot has this other potential of telling Mike where to put things. So it's using its measurement capability to say, put a fixture here, put a fixture here, and then put the part at this position. And then the robot can do some welding, because robots can, actually, for each weld, it takes the robot five seconds to do the weld. Uh, and fixturing and getting things every, everything ready is really where the time, the clock, just starts to spin around. And so if Mike's told where to do these things and what fixtures to use, he can just basically put it there with the de his dexterous hand. So actually, humans have this amazing ability. And of course, we're working on robots to do this, and it's going to be cutting into the space a little bit. So that's going to be exciting to follow as well. So the first step of this is we simulate the whole process uh, and show it to the person who's going to be doing the manufacturing. So we, sh we show the robot. We show the environment. We show the parts. We even show the virtual reality. So this green is uh, projected from the robot. So the robot's going to project this green bar telling the person where to put the next piece, piece by piece, along with a piece number so he doesn't get them confused and puts the right piece down. Uh, and so the person watches that go through once, and then this steps through as he does each step in the process. So. Attached to the robot, we, we have the, the torch, and we have uh, the augmented reality that's painted life-size onto the real world. So now we have a robot that basically can pr present three-dimensional information onto the world. So it's literally part of the world. So it's amazing. Instead of, you know, you've heard about Google Glasses, that sort of thing, where it's, you see it through your eyes. But imagine if you basically the world was lit up with kind of the relevant salient information when you're doing a complicated task like this, step by step. So then we go th through the process of projecting where Mike's to, do, to put something down. We build it up, and the robot then inspects its position to make sure he's put it in the right place. If he put it in the wrong place, actually the, the robot can say, change its part program so that it welds in a different location to where it was actually placed. This is very hard to place something within less than a millimeter. So if he puts it you know, five millimeters off and one degree off, uh, the robot can make up for that and basically weld it right anyway. And then the robot can proceed to do welding that it can do easily. So here's a movie of kind of the whole idea, the whole system. So we see the robot doing the weld. Many of these welds can be just knocked out in five seconds each by the robot. So the robot's doing what it can do amazingly well. Mike's helped in setting up that octagon uh, shape. But some of these complicated structures, basically the robot's just stepping him through what he has to do, uh, and then he does it manually. And then we've included assembly and uh, 
adding on assembly components, again telling him what he had to do. And then ultimately this is going to lead to a custom vehicle. So that, that was the result and so now we have to consider who won this competition. Uh, the black team with our three guys doing the welding, uh, all huddled in the back room here. Uh, took three hours and they charged $75 an hour for welding. Uh, the raw materials for these raw bar stock, the square, square tubes is $400 uh, and they are billable hours because they have to mark down on a timesheet how long it took. Uh, it took 89 billable hours to uh, make the pieces. So the total cost is 89 times 75 plus 400 which boils down to uh, $6,850. So, over on the red team, how, long, how did Mike do? Ten billable hours, $75 an hour plus 400. Total cost, 1150. So if you think about this, now we can make six or seven of these at the same cost as we took one before. And these are experts. We're not talking about, you know, hourly workers. The three Pratt & Miller guys are professionals that are professionally doing this to make custom things as fast as they can without the robot. So it's not like they were just kind of assembly line, you know, assembly line workers that we dragged in to do this task, but these are really good welding people that do this 24-7 and love to do it. And Mike was kind of a beginner and actually learned how to weld from these guys. Uh, and he was able to do the same task in 10 hours. It's actually stunning. And when Mike, when Mike came in, so Mike was the winner, uh, when Mike came in to tell me about this, it was unbelievable. I've never seen anything quite like this. He burst into my office and said, David, I did it. I built that thing in 10 hours. And you wouldn't have believed the size of his smile. It, it filled up my entire office. I, there wasn't room in there for me. <laughs> Because think of it, if you could build a boat in your basement in 10 hours, or anything amazingly complicated with some assistance, that changes everything. That changes everything. And not only that, but people are involved in the process. He knows exactly what happened. He knew exactly, he knew what, if there was any glitch in the welding, he knew exactly what that was and he would go through and tell you a litany of these things. So he was intrinsically part of the process. So not only did he do it better, he did it faster, he did it cheaper, he enjoyed the heck out of it, but he didn't forget. <laughs> he knew how he did it, he understood it, it became part of him, and it's part of his life story. So there's some key lessons learned here. Robots and people really work faster together because no matter what happens, we're gonna be better at doing some things and robots are gonna be better at doing other things. And that's gonna persist, that's going to continue. They might change, the boundaries might change, but that's going to persist. The optimal task assignments between these two things is actually surprising. Everyone says, well, people are still gonna tell the robots what to do. No! The robot's gonna tell the person what to do in many cases because he has, that, he has the information about the sequence, the detailed position, and has an effective way to present what the person needs to do. And that's okay, that doesn't take any of the fun out of it. Cheaper products go hand in hand with doing something fast. Actually, if you look at the bulk of the cost of these things, it's all in the labor. So if you can cut down the labor time, the cost of the final product almost goes down linearly with it. And that's kind of a surprising result. And this is fun. This is amazingly fun. I mean, just think about changing the plumbing in your house. If you could go into your house and, you know, your plumbing gets all jammed up or something, that's like, you know, most husbands' nightmare. But now if you had an assistant that basically told you, here are the parts, here are the tools, and here's basically the procedure and the sequence, you can do it effectively. You don't have to drive back and forth to Lowe's six times. Uh, which is what I usually do, uh, and, and effectively make something, effectively fix something. 
And that's really part of, a key part of the human experience, part of what makes our memory. And this is my secretary, and she made her uh, Christmas card with, with uh, standing next to a uh, robot. So robots and people are mem making memories in all sorts of ways. Uh, so thank you very much for letting me uh, share my story, and uh, it was a great pleasure.